Cobble here with a brief deck tech for the Iconic Masters Challenge. The deck I chose is a modern list called Lantern Control. The 60 card version of this list wants to control the opponent's hand through precise manipulation of their top deck. The namesake artifact, Lantern of Insight, is combined with cards like Pixis of Pandemonium, Codex Shredder, and Ghoul Caller's Bell to make sure the opponent never gets to draw the pieces they need to play according to their game plan. Your game plan is going great if your opponent spends the entire game never drawing anything other than land. Translating this concept into CEDH is tricky because, for one thing, we can't run four copies of each of the top deck manipulators found in the 60 card version. And if we could, they don't scale or give us the precision we need to maintain control over three opposing top decks simultaneously. Even Circu, Dimmer Lobotomist, who's often a favorite for building this sort of deck in EDH, doesn't give us what we need because his top deck ability is an active one. In other words, because Circu's ability triggers on spells being cast, we would potentially need to cast three or more spells every turn in order to maintain control of what our opponents are drawing. To compound matters, CEDH is a format characterized by high-volume card advantage pieces like Mystic Remora, Ristic Study, Kraum, Timna, and Thrasios. Fine-grained control over one card at a time on an opponent's top deck isn't going to do well when we expect everyone to be drawing so many cards. So what can we do? The best choice for exerting hand control in EDH is through passive effects. Cards like Uba Mask, Chains of Mephistopheles, Hull Breacher, Notion Thief, and Narset Parter of Veils allow us to disrupt opponent draws statically without needing to cast spells or spend resources to make it happen. And these cards scale to interact with as many draw effects each player tries to execute. But we can go further than simply punishing opponents who actively try to outdraw the rest of the table. By pairing our passive draw inhibitors with wheel effects that force everyone to draw, we can endeavor to keep all opponents as close to hellbent as possible. A side effect to this is that, depending on the draw disruptor we have in play, we can wind up going hellbent too. And that's where our commander comes into the picture. Rico, the Tiger's Shadow, besides being almost impossible to keep off of the table, provides an excellent stream of card advantage that doesn't actually involve drawing any cards. Thus, she lets us break parity with pieces that hate on draw in a symmetric way, and she lets us far outpace our opponents when we've got pieces that hate on draw asymmetrically. As is customary for Eureka lists, we're running cheap evasive creatures like Ornithopter, Stone Coil Serpent, and Cabal Therapist to make sure we can reliably swing in unblocked so that Eureka can use her ninjutsu ability when necessary to keep connecting for damage. We're also running a handful of other ninjas too, but the goal here isn't about using Ninja Tribal. One or two extra cards per turn is plenty when the rest of the table is locked in at one. Don't forget, too, that we're also running Sakashima of a Thousand Faces and Spark Double to create extra copies of Yuriko so we can greatly amplify the impact of even a single ninja making contact. Of course, there's times we'll draw nine cards when all three make contact together, and that's a pretty good situation, too. Even though Yuriko's card advantage ability damages our opponents, we're not running high CMC do-nothing cards to inflate the burn effect. Our main goal is firmly centered around controlling opponent hands and outpacing their ability to access cards. If we're succeeding at that, we can shift focus to finding Oracle plus consultation to win concisely, or we can just keep at the control game and let Yuriko burn opponents out by degrees. Even with the deck's low average CMC, multiple Yurikos in play will steadily drain opponent life totals in pretty short order. Diving into the creature suite, we basically have three categories to look at. The first we mentioned already being cheap evasive creatures that keep us attacking unblocked for efficient rates so we can be sure Eureka earns card advantage as consistently as possible. The next group are sources of disruption. 
These include Notion Thief and Hall Breacher, but also Gilded Drake for taking opponents off important combo or value pieces, and Opposition Agent for keeping opponents off their tutors. We spend a lot of energy in this deck specifically disrupting opponent access to draw, but tutor access is hugely important as well. A lot of times, opponents won't have removal for our hay pieces immediately available in hand. So if we can keep them off of tutors, they're doubly impacted. On the one hand, they can't search up combo pieces to win the game, and on the other, they can't go looking for answers to return the board to a state of parity. For all these reasons, Opposition Agent is a high-priority creature that we want to get in play as early as possible, if we can. The last group of creatures in the list is the Ninja Suite. Again, we keep this fairly minimal. Just Changeling Outcast, Moth Dust Changeling, and Ingenious Infiltrator as ninjas in and of themselves, along with Sakashima and Spark Double as extra copies of Yuriko, so that even a single ninja making contact draws multiple cards per turn. The Sorcery Suite has no real surprises. We've got Windfall, Time Twister, and Echo of Aeons making up our wheel package. Echo of Aeons definitely doesn't see much CEDH play, but it's a good fit here because it stings quite hard when Eureka reveals it off the top, and being able to cast it for its flashback cost from the graveyard is very flexible at different points in the game, especially if we've got Chains of Mephistopheles in play. Our tutor package includes standard fare like Imperial Seal, Demonic Tutor, and Diabolic Intent, and also expands outside normal staples to include Personal Tutor, which works well with Eureka for finding wheels, particularly the aforementioned Echo of Aeons. Transmute Artifact is almost exclusively included for increasing our chances of landing Uba Mask, which we'll talk about in a moment. Looking at our instance, we've got 10 counter spells, and lots of removal in the form of Submerge, Deadly Rollick, Winds of Rebuke, Snap, Run Away Together, and Chain of Vapor. It's very important for us to have tools for removing important pieces our opponents are relying on. We want to set their tempo back whenever possible so we can maintain a controlling posture. And sometimes just removing blockers is a worthy justification in and of itself, so we can keep the stream of Eureka card advantage coming. A lot of our selections in this instant portfolio are higher CMC than typical CEDH parlance. This is fine because in each case they have a free to cast mode that we can leverage to maintain good action economy while still expecting modest burn to our opponents when revealing cards to Eureka. This largely explains why we aren't on ad nauseum in this list as well. The idea, once again, is that we aren't committing our resources to comboing out as soon as possible. Instead, we're wanting to disrupt anyone else from doing so while we make deliberate control choices and let Eureka handle the rest. Moving on to artifacts, the mana suite is fairly straightforward, consisting of 12 mostly typical rocks. Thought Vessel doesn't see much play, but we're running it here because we can anticipate situations where our card advantage will outpace our rate of playing cards to the board. We also want to hold up as much interaction as possible for control purposes, so having an unbounded hand side pays dividends in this regard. It's worth mentioning, too, that Necropotence feels really good if you can hang on to all of the cards you put into hand instead of having to discard down to seven if you're not going to win on the spot. Uba Mask is one of the most disruptive pieces in the list. To be clear, it exiles every card that would be drawn by each player. There's no special dispensation for the first card a player would draw each turn like you see on Hull Breacher and Notion Thief. And since the card stipulates that players can only play cards they've exiled that turn, it means players relying on combos to finish the game are going to be in a world of hurt when they permanently orphan part of their combo package in exile. It also implies that nobody can develop a hand by degrees over turns the way that they would normally do so against Thieves or Chains of Mephistopheles. Nobody, that is, other than us, because Eureka's card advantage is not a draw ability and thus allows us to skirt the problem and break parity. The 
The enchantment package is straightforward. Mystic Remora, Ristic Study, and Necropotence all contribute to our card advantage plan and don't behave differently here than they would in other contexts throughout CEDH. Chains of Mephistopheles, on the other hand, is a centerpiece for the list. It's another incredibly powerful and important piece of disruption that makes traditional incremental card advantage engines in the format effectively untenable. Because it's symmetric, we need to be cognizant of its impact on our own game, but our commander lets us break parity and in doing so minimizes negative effects since we'll generally have cards in hand that we can discard as we sculpt a hand optimized for controlling the board while we pursue a reasonable route towards the end game. Psychic Surgery is added here purely as a nod to the ideals espoused by the 60-card version of Lantern Control. Yes, that list doesn't actually run this card, but it's a reasonable approximation of the behavior that list embodies that happens to scale to the four-player model we see in CEDH. And that is about all there is to say. Bringing Lantern Control to CEDH requires quite a bit of license and reimagination. I hope that this particular implementation preserves at least some of the goals of the original concept. It's an interesting challenge and was a fun exercise in design. How do you think I did? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.